I study how the brain, which is encased in silence and darkness, how it constructs our reality. And the reason we know that this has something to do with the brain is because if the brain is damaged, even in small ways, your reality changes. And if you take drugs or alcohol or other sorts of things, viruses in the system, your reality can change. So I'm interested in finding where our perspectives overlap in this, because your interest is, one of your interests is also understanding reality, how we perceive it, how it's individualized to us. So can you tell us about that? There is, uh, there is existence outside, and there is you or me as individual human beings. We have not seen the world. We know it only the way it's projected in the firmament of our minds. When we say mind, in English language, mind is just one word and supposed to encompass everything. But in the yogic terminology, we have sixteen parts of the mind which function distinct functions. And there are a whole lot of practices and processes through which one takes charge of these sixteen dimensions of mind. This sixteen for simpler understanding can be brought into four, four sections. The first dimension of the mind is we are referring to as buddhi or what is generally considered intellect. I think modern societies, particularly modern education, has become too overly focused on the intellect. We got too mes mesmerized by our own logic and uh, we have invested too much in human intellect, leaving out the other dimensions of intelligence that functions within us. The second dimension of the mind, we call it as ahankara, which in English language would translate as the identity. What is the identity you have taken? Your intellect is always a slave of your identity. What you identified with, it is only around that it functions. Simple things. People are identified with things that they have not even seen and huge emotions are there, their life is guided by those things. For example, all of us belong to some nation today. Just the moment you believe I belong to this nation, the emblem of that nation, the flag of that nation, the anthem of that nation, brings genuine emotion, there nobody's pretending, it's real. It's real because people are willing to die for it, it has to be real. But it's just an identity, you could just switch it any time. You can move to another country and take that on and it becomes yours. So the moment you identify yourself with something, your intellect is completely always protecting this identity and working around this identity. The next dimension of the mind is called as manas. So this is not just in one place, this is the entire body. Manas is a huge silo of memory. So when I say huge silo of memory, whatever memory you may have in your brain, I know you're a brain fan <laughs> Whatever memory you may have in your brain, your body has a trillion times more memory than that. You definitely don't remember how your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather looked like, but his nose is sitting on your face right now. It remembers. How your forefathers looked a million years ago, your body still remembers, has not forgotten. Definitely it is not the capability of your brain. So, in terms of memory, the manas is phenomenal and it's right across the body. Every cell in the body carries enormous memory. Memory to a point for the origin of life on this planet and beyond. All that memory is carried in this body. So this is manas. If there is no memory, intellect would be defunct, it's like a car without gas. Because there is memory, intellect is on. This memory flows through the hand of identity and whatever is the identity, the memory takes on that color accordingly and then it plays up in the intellect and intellect functions. The fourth dimension of the mind is called chitta. Chitta means it's pure intelligence, unsullied by memory. There is absolutely no memory, free of memory, it's just pure intelligence. When we say pure intelligence, 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 everything is smacked with phenomenal intelligence beyond what our 
quite phenomenal brain cannot perceive. So, this is a dimension of intelligence within us, which is the basis of our creation in a way. If you eat a piece of bread, over the afternoon it becomes a human being because this intelligence exists within you and me. So, if you touch this intelligence, you don't have to think what you want, you don't have to seek what you want. If you touch this intelligence, everything that you wish to know is yours. It's just you have to just direct your focus and it's all there because there is a dimension of chitta. Every human being might have accidentally at some point touched this, which makes suddenly one spark of magic in somebody's life. This is because they've touched this dimension of intelligence unconsciously. Now the question is only about how to get there consciously and to stay there. So these aspects of the mind are not entirely located here, it is right across the system. I kind of think this is the endeavor of science, is to take the intelligence all around us and across our system and try to understand the principles of that. It's a way of going out and trying to understand the blueprints around us in a way that can be made conscious as something that we can make um, understandable. When you say understandable, that means we can put it into the parameters of logic. What… what if there is a dimension of intelligence within you which does not fit into the parameters of logic? Trying to fit everything into the parameters of logic means the surface intelligence, which is the intellect, which is our survival mode. If we don't have an intellect, we wouldn't survive in this world. What is a survival instrument? We are trying to put all dimensions of life through that and it has to pass through that sieve. That will con completely skew the process. I take the point that there may be limits to our intellect, but I don't know where those limits are. And I don't know how to guarantee that there are borders there beyond which there's something else. See, science has done incredible things in the last hundred years, no question. Our life is the way it is today. The comfort and convenience that all of us are enjoying is essentially because of the outcome of the scientific endeavor on the planet, there's no question about that. But at the same time, the limitation of science is, we are trying to touch a dimension which is beyond physical nature with a physical stick. Something that you and I had uh, talked about before is this issue of uh, time perception. It's one of the things I study in my lab. And I was mentioning to you that I think it's one of the most stubborn psychological filters we have, by which I mean time seems to be a construction of the brain because we can easily manipulate it in the laboratory so that you think something lasted longer or shorter or something happened in a different order. And there are many physicists like Einstein who, who were very clear on this point that time doesn't actually exist, but, but we're trapped inside of it. In the yogic way of seeing things, we just see life as a dance of time and energy. It's a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. Actually, in the local languages, the expression for death is very beautiful. We say kalamaitanga, that means his time got over. When we… in normal language, when we say somebody passed away, we don't say it as we are saying it in English, we say his time got over. Actually, that's all that happened, somebody's time got over. <laughs> now, to put this time and energy together in a proper… weave it together well, if your time gets over, when your still energy is vibrant, we say this is an untimely death. If your energy gets over, when your still time is on, it's a vegetative life. To the art of putting this time and energy together, so that both of them play together, dance together well, is a successful life. So when we say time, there are many, many things we can do with energy, but our time is ticking off at the same pace. We may think many things, we came to this talk, we went to the cinema, we went to the university, we went here and there, but as far as physical body is concerned, it's going straight to the grave because it is keeping time. Your brain 
can be easily fooled. <laughs> but body is properly keeping time, never you can fool this body, all the time keeping time. Because time is a consequence, time is not a factor by itself. Time is a consequence of cyclical movements in the physical reality. We know time, if, if the earth spins once, we say it's a day. If the moon goes around us, we say it's a month. If the earth goes around the sun, we say it's a year. Our idea of time has come essentially because of the cyclical movements of everything that's physical around us. This is the nature of physicality. Physicality is essentially cyclical, whether it's atomic or cosmic, everything is cyclical. The moment you're identified with physical nature, time is a big factor. If you dissociate yourself with your physical nature, if you sit here and if you have a little space between you and your physical body, because what you call as my body is an accumulated process. It is something that you accumulated, it's just a piece of the planet. If a little space comes between you and your body, suddenly time is not a factor. To such an extent, we have any number of people, this may be very difficult for uh, a Western audience to digest, but I have seen yogis who have not moved from the place they were sitting for over six months, seven months, just in the same place. By any normal standards, your body should not survive that. But once they sit down, they won't move, just like that, not moving at all. Because once you distance yourself from your physiological process, time is not a factor. Right now you're sitting here, it's not your watch which is keeping the time, it's your body. If I make you sit here for three hours, your body self says it's enough. But suppose you did not have a body, we're going to sit here for three thousand years, what's the problem? So essentially, because of your rooting in your physical platform, which you call as the body, which you built over a period of time, from the accumulations that you gathered from this planet, that is the basis of experience of time. If you distance yourself from that, there is no consequence of time on you. What is the you that can be separated from the physical? Is it a fact that you gathered your body over a period of time? It's a fact that this body gathered together over a period of time and it may be that I emerge as a consequence of that, this feeling of I as opposed to me doing the gathering. So the data that you and me have gathered, however big we may think it is, in terms of the cosmos, it's minuscule, it's nothing. It's really not of any consequence. So from this minuscule of data that we have gathered, we are generating some thought which could be useful in making our lives, it could be useful in creating a few things, it could be useful fundamentally for our survival and to enhancement of our survival process all this, but it doesn't give you access to life. Human intellect and human intelligence has broken out of a certain bond which was there for every other creature that they could function like an automated machine through certain instinctual process. What has happened with the human being with the process of evolution is, he's… the human being has broken out of that instinctual process and there is an intelligence which has to function consciously. But functioning consciously means every moment of life is an exploration, which is too scary for a whole lot of people. So the best thing is identify with something which gives you some sense of what you are. But this some sense of what you are which you took on ba based on your social and cultural backgrounds, what you took on makes sense for your survival process but not for explorative process. It doesn't explore life, it keeps you sane. It's a good solace, it keeps you… It, it helps you to sleep well in the night, but it doesn't awaken a different dimension of knowing, it doesn't awaken the possibility of exploring dimensions which are not yet within you. So if this has to happen, the most important thing is to be able to sit here not identified with anything. When I said, it's so hard to remain uneducated in this world because everybody is busy wanting to teach you something. This is all I did in my life, to remain uneducated, not to be influenced by parents, by family, by religion that's happening around you, culture that's happening around you, education that people are forcing on you, just to be 
the way creation intended you to be, simply. See, I may not uh, fit into the university milieu, but I'm okay, you know. <laughs> Just simply the way you were born. Not tangling up your intelligence to any particular thing, either your nationality or your religion or your race or your creed or your family or any kind of identity or your gender or whatever, simply to be able to view your life just as a piece of life. If one does this, then you will see perception will explode in ways that they have not imagined possible. So, from my perspective, there's this issue of, of brain plasticity, which is to say that we absorb what's coming in. And I think it's exactly consistent with your description about um, who you are in the end is, is an accumulation of all these perceptions. There's also the case that we are creatures that go around and vacuum in the, our cultures and we speak this particular language and we, we are males and we dress in certain ways. Um, it's hard to avoid that. Now, I'm guessing you're going to say, but you don't identify with it. Is that, is that right? See, what is a social requirement is one thing. Identity is required for survival process to manage day-to-day -day situations, but it is not an exploratory process. Because the intention of science is to know. See, technology is a fallout. Unfortunately, in this world, nobody would fund science if it did not spin technology, which is a very unfortunate thing. Because human intelligence wants to know, it need not be useful, it simply wants to know. So technology is useful and what is useful today, tomorrow you may realize is very destructive, it may take away our life. So technology is something that we have to judiciously do. Science must happen rampantly, mysticism must happen rampantly because this is simply exploratory. This is not about seeing how to make it useful, but today, Modern science has become a slave of technology. If you don't make it useful, nobody is going to fund you anymore. If you simply say, I want to know, nobody is interested in this. How can it be turned into an enterprise? That's all they're interested in. This is a wrong way to approach science because science is a… Is, is a fundamental need within a human being wanting to know. It's the nature of human intelligence. It is not something that somebody made up. It's not a bunch of scientists who made this up. This is a fundamental need within human intelligence wanting to know. It is the nature of a human being, if he sees something new, he wants to know what this is, whether it's a small thing or a big thing. So to continuously sustain that wonder, that sense of wanting to know is the basis of science and mysticism. It is only the fundamental approach is different in the sense, science is trying to achieve everything through physical means by taking physical quantities, going by the physical laws. If you go through physical means, you will hit that glass wall somewhere. I think, in my perception, I'm not a scientist, I don't know all of it, but in my perception, I think the physicists are near the glass wall. They might not have hit it, they're near. That's the unknown question, right? We have no guarantee how far we'll get in science. By, by glass wall, I assume you mean we, we run to a place where we where, say we can't… Where the present faculties will not be good enough. Um, the yeah. present, present faculties of five senses and a brain will not be good enough. That we hit a, a long time ago. So for example, things like quantum so. physics, quantum physics you can't understand it. But you can write it down in equations that make predictions accurate out to 14 decimal places. So we think it's pretty good and we can build new things out of it that we, we can see things much smaller and much farther away than we ever could before. We understand the, the wondrousness and the subtleness of everything around us much better than we did before. But the actual physics, a human can't understand. We just make tools to, uh, to get where we need to go with it. So we've already hit that point. And certainly it's the case with the human brain which is made up of a, you know, almost a hundred billion specialized cells with 
thousands of trillions of connections between them and uh, every I, I second. I like the way you're saying it with the, the passion. <laughs> <laughs> like some people are talking about food or something well, else. I'm a brainy instead of a food. You feed on the brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason it's easy to be passionate about it is because it's a system of such unimaginable complexity that it bankrupts the language. It, 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 we have no way that a human could perceive a system of that complexity, and yet each of us has it. Uh, it you know, there's this three-pound organ that we're carrying around, but we've already hit that point a long time ago in science where we realized we can make new strains of mathematics, we can make computer simulations, but we'll never get it. I'll never get the brain. All I can do is take the, uh, uh, you know, the way, the way that you explained the 16 aspects of the mind, you simplified it down to four. I'm, I, I, you know, the best I can do is take the thousands of trillions of connections in the brain and make some cartoony model that my impoverished intellect can sort of get, its, get a sense of. They're building a simulator. Brain simulator, you know? Yeah. Andrew Makram is busy <laughs> building this simulated brain. Uh, all that is fine. We are looking at the physical mechanics of what's happening. The complexity of what's happening is beyond the physical mechanics. See, looking at the physical mechanics of the brain, the neuronal function and the electric… Uh, the thing that's happening, the waves that are flowing, whatever things happening is fantastic because of the complexity of what it is, the sophistication of what it is. It is the gadget, no question, okay? This human gadget is the gadget on the planet. Of what we have seen, this is the most sophisticated gadget on the planet, there's no question about that. Keeping that aside, but even this brain can be manufactured with something as simple as a piece of a carrot or a bread. So I'm saying, there is an intelligence here which can create a brain. Why are you ignoring that intelligence? I think the heart of science is to try to understand what that is. What I mean by that is, um, you know, so we, we have different uh, approaches in science to get there, but studying the genetic code and understanding how the heck with 27,000 genes can you unpack a human being? Because whatever the whatever the truth is of what's happening, happening spiritually, if there's a separate you or not, what we know for sure is that you can unpack a human being from, from these four <laughs> letters of amino acids and these base pairs that make, make these proteins and, and somehow that all gets unpacked. You know, these kind of questions have always been on human mind. It happened almost 15,000 years ago. Adi Yogi, that means the first yogi, he had seven disciples. These seven disciples are full of questions. They are… some of them are astronomers, some of them are serious mathematicians, things like this. They have million questions. After some time, Adi Yogi is bored with their questions because whatever they ask, it's just a product of their intellect. They're not able to ask a question beyond that. So they ask, what is the nature of this, your cosmos? Where does it begin? Where does it end? How big is it? He's just bored. So he says, your… your cosmos, I can pack it into your mustard seed. The entire cosmos, I can pack it into your mustard seed. Then they were flabbergasted by this. Then they said, what is it made of? If you can pack such a huge cosmos, which we do… we can't even imagine where it begins and where it ends into your mustard seed, what is it made of? He was completely bored, even not to utter a word, he simply said like this. Five elements. Just these five elements, the entire universe is a play of these five elements. If you master the five elements, you have a key to every aspect of creation. If you don't master the five elements, if you approach it from outside, as you approach it, it will take on a trillion new forms. As you try to study it, it can take on a trillion new forms as you're looking at it, because that is what it is capable of. Just five things. Five million things would be difficult. Five, I'm sure you and me can study, isn't it? At least I'm capable of five. <laughs> You're talking in millions and billions, but I'm five. Are you going to tell me what the five are? <laughs>
These five elements, it's called earth, fire, water, air, space, these are five things. Everything is just within this, everything that you call as physical creation has substance of some kind, this is earth. And all of it is in movement, that's called air. All of it ascribes to some temperature, that is fire. And in everything there is water, which is the cohesiveness. If there is no water, there is no cohesiveness in anything. And all of it is held together by what we call as akash. Here we are calling it a space in English language, it doesn't really describe what we are saying, but it's called akash, maybe a more closer word in English language would be ether, etheric space or whatever they're calling it as. So, these are the five things, whether an atom or a subatomic particle, everything is made of these five things. So you don't have to study the trillions of things which are manifestations of these five. If you understand these five things, if you have grasp over these five things, then everything becomes accessible. So the fundamental, the most basic process, unfortunately the word yoga conjures completely wrong images in America, the most fundamental aspect of yoga is called Bhuta Shuddhi. This means cleansing of the elements so that you can feel them separately in your own system. This very body is seventy-two percent water and twelve percent earth, six percent air, four percent fire, remaining is space. If you take charge of these things, what you need to know, everything that is life is here because modern physicists are saying, as you sit here, every subatomic particle is in communication with the rest of the cosmos. If it is so, you just have to become alive to it, you just have to become receptive to it, whether it is the smallest thing or the biggest thing. Everything, the fundamental design is same, it is only the complexity and sophistication which is improving. Between an amoeba and you, the fundamental design is same. It is much more complex and sophisticated, but essentially life-making design is same. So if it is so, the most fundamental materials which make this life and every other physical aspect of what we see in this creation, if we know the ingredients and how they happen, then you have a key to every aspect of life. But if you try to study the creation itself, as you study they will multiply into billions and trillions. It seems it might depend what your goal is. So if you want to create a drug for cancer or build a helicopter, you need to do something with those five elements. So, so it's not about exploration, it's about Utility. What is the use of life? Let me ask you a question. I, I, w I would love to know. I've, I've wondered <laughs> that question. <laughs> and I get it that science, science isn't getting me there. I mean, I don't, I've been in science my whole adult life, but I don't know. I get much more towards that question when I read literature, which was my first love before I went to science. So, um, so I, I take the point that science doesn't help me on that front at all. What would you say? I've wondered what the point is. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, when, uh, when we're looking at everything as, see right now, this is an unfortunate reality which is… Uh, doesn't agree with my aesthetics of life. Right now, science has moved from an exploratory process to an exploitative process. If you see an atom, how to use it? If you see a bacteria, how to use it? If you see an elephant, how to use it? If you use a whale, how to use it? Of course, the next thing is if you see a human being, how to use them? This is where it's going. Everything, how to use it? This is not what life is about. You may get to know how to use every damn thing, but still, life won't get any better. If you know how to keep this one, life will get better, believe me. If you just know how to sit here blissed out, Life will get better. I see that point. Let me ask you this. I'm trying to understand this issue about knowing the, the unslakable thirst for knowledge that humans have means that there's this ratcheting up each generation. So it's not that I'm... It is, of course, the case that I'm limited in my thoughts to the impressions that I've had, but I have a much bigger fire hose of impressions now that can build on the scaffolding of the generations before me, the things they've already figured out, so that I can start at the next, at the next level and move start up. Start at the next level for what? Towards what end? Um, 
Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's it's the toward the end of of knowing, in the way that in the way that science cares about knowing. So putting aside usefulness of technology, just the way that scientists ask questions. If knowing is the purpose, because wanting to know how much time and energy somebody is willing to dedicate to that may be questionable from person to person, but everybody wants to know, there's no question about that. But knowing everything by intellect, we will know the surface of everything but never the real source of everything or the core of everything. Because the only piece of… the only doorway to our experience is this human mechanism. You don't know the world any other way than the way this one is projecting right now within itself, yes? Agreed. I don't know how you are really, I only know the way your picture is right now projecting in my brain or my system and how I'm perceiving it. As you know, you have drilled holes into people's brains and impact something, something <laughs> and put electric current and whatever you've done. I'm not saying you as a person, I'm saying these things have been done. Uh, you definitely know by interfering with a certain physical process, the whole perception could change. The world has not changed, but perception has changed, so in his experience everything has changed. So that dimension of life is only useful for survival. When I say survival, everything that we're doing is survival. To survive better, to enhance our survival to a better status or in an enhanced way of survival process. But once you've come as a human being, it doesn't matter how well you survive, still it is not good enough, isn't it? It's never going to be good enough because survival is not going to fulfill a human being. It doesn't matter how big our homes get, how big our cars get, how energy efficient it gets, how better we dress, how better we eat, still we will feel it's not enough because that's not the direction in which the life wants to go. So here's the part I'm trying to understand is this issue about knowing, this issue about seeking knowledge. Let's say um, either in science or in mysticism, we depend on our senses for that, yes? Or are you saying that… I'm saying they're not dependable. Agreed. See, for example, suppose you or me were lost in the jungle as infants, okay? If something edible came, we definitely would take it and put it in the mouth. We wouldn't try our ears fast, then nostrils and then sudden by accident discover the mouth, no. We just know how to eat, no question about that. So I'm saying everything concerned with our survival is inbuilt, it's there. This is millions of years of memory which is there within us, we know how to survive. But we would know how to read, we would know how to do so many other things which have become a part of our life. Do you remember when you were two or three years of age when they tried to t teach you that alphabet, the damn A, how complicated it was? It was so complicated just to get it right, you had to write hundred times to get it. Today with eyes closed you can do it because of a certain striving, isn't it? Similarly, anything beyond survival, if we have to have it in our lives, a certain striving is needed. As I said, striving for inward perception is something unfortunately that's been banished in modern, modern societies because we are on the thrill of technology. It's a fantastic thing. But you will see as time progresses, as technology becomes better and better, human beings will become more and more frustrated. If you have not noticed this, just look out and see, you will see eight-year-old, ten-year-old kids bored. In your generation or my generation, we would have never seen, we never knew what is damn boredom is. When you're eight or ten, you were just bubbling with life and on, but today you see ten-year-old kids are just bored with it because They've seen the damn cosmos through their phone screen. <laughs> they know it all. <laughs> so I'm saying all this excess may not lead to betterment of life and it will not. Comfort and convenience will come. But well-being will not happen. The purpose of enhancing human experience on this planet will not happen. It will only entertain us intellectually big time, which it is. 
No question. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying it's limited. For now, yes, but… No, as can, you know… So right now, it can happen. Right now, with a phone, I can uh, talk to somebody in India. It may… technology may come, I can smell the food that they're cooking in India. If I'm missing home, they can turn on the phone and I can smell the food from India. It may happen. I'm not saying it's beyond that. It's very much possible it may happen. But I can do it without a phone also. Look, I think our science is too young still to know whether we are uh, always going to confront a multiplication of problems or, or not. No, I, don't, I don't say they're problems. Uh, question. There will be more things to study, that's all. Yes, but in ter sometimes people call that weenie science, by which I mean once you understand the structure of the atom and so on, you could measure the neutron to finer and finer resolution, but who cares? Because that's not the fundamental problem anymore. And we're still at such a young age that we don't know whether science will keep bifurcating into more and more interesting questions or whether it'll just become weighing things and it doesn't matter because now we kind of get the core of it. We might not know that for a hundred years or a thousand years, but I don't know for certain that we are doomed to infinite complexity. It may be that we can put together a very clear... Now what I'm saying is you're fundamentally employing sense organs. I agree with that. Sense organ is the basis of all scientific pursuit. I'm saying sense organs are not reliable instruments. You asked the owl. I, I just, I think that the pursuit of science is really trying to surmount our sense organs. It's trying to figure out uh, this... Now, how would they surmount? By understanding laws of nature that we don't know why they're true, but they seem to be correct, like quantum mechanics, like basic Newtonian physics, by, you know, um, figuring out why force equals mass times acceleration. Why is that true? Nobody knows. But that's the way that people pursue trying to understand it's a way of reaching into the cosmos and figuring out that there are laws that go beyond my sense organs. I have, I have no way to, to smell or touch F equals MA, and yet it seems to hold. And that's the sense in which we go beyond the, the little peripheral devices that we come to the table with and try to understand what's past that. It is true that we have to translate things into equations and equations we might write down or we might hear if we're a blind person. Um, but in theory, that's something that's beyond our basic sensory apparatus. Just for convenience, I'll make it into four, okay? <laughs> we look at creation as four different dimensions. Stula, which means the gross physical creation. Sukshma, which means subtle. That means you cannot perceive them through sense organs, but if you hone your attention to a certain level, then you can perceive that. So this is called as Vishesh Gyan, which means an extraordinary perception, or it's called Vigyan. Today in India, in local languages, the word for science is Vigyan, okay? That means it's Vishesh Gyan. Vishesh Gyan means extraordinary perception. So we are perceiving things that our sense organs could not perceive, but still they are in the realm of physicality. And all physicality is perceivable through sense organs if they are horned well. If you may not be able to perceive, some other creature on the planet is able to perceive. So, so what is called a stula is gross reality, which all of us can see and hear and smell. What is considered a sukshma, still physicality, but so subtle that your eyes and ears are not good enough for that, but if you're willing to pay attention, you can perceive. Then next is called a shunya, which literally translates as emptiness in English, but emptiness is not the word. It is… it is physicality without form. There is no form. All physical has defined form, but shunya means physicality has reached a place where there is no form to it, it's just physical or it's fundamental material of physicality. The next is called as Shiva, which means that which is not. That means that which is not physical at all. So, existence is seen as these four components. 
and how to perceive these four dimensions. There's a whole methodology. Why I'm saying this is, if only scientists who have pursued things so far into physical reality, if they pay little attention to the most fundamental physicality which is themselves, if they turn inward rather than constantly looking through a telescope or a microscope, if they spend equal amount of time turning inward, I think something phenomenal could come out of it. Many scientists, the reason they turn outward is as a way of, of understanding what what this is all made out of, which would include, which would include understanding something about what a piece of life is. Uh, let me ask you this, when you say, I am a piece of life, you are a piece of life, I hear that and understand it in a particular way, but I'm, I want to know what you mean by a, a piece of life. Because uh, what you drink is life, what you eat is life, what you breathe is life, all this we are gathering and this is a piece of life, which has acquired a certain level of information, built its own kind of software unconsciously and its own tendencies and its own character and its own personality. But that's a bubble. It's like if you blow soap bubbles, each bubble has a character of its own. When they burst, the most essential ingredient of the bubble was the air. Where is it? It's all there. So this is all air and the bubble is a piece of air. Similarly, this is all life. This whole cosmos is a living cosmos. Here I am a piece of life. And I have… this is… life has given me this privilege that I can hold this piece of life within myself and experience it as if I am by myself everything. This is a fantastic privilege, but we should not abuse this <laughs> And… and do you see that as being illusory, the idea that you're a piece of life and I'm a piece of life, given that we share atoms and when I'm breathing out and you're breathing in and so on, we're exchanging atoms, do you… do you… do you see that as an illusion that there is a you and a me or is that… are we all the same um, life? See, the thing is right now, you know, all these apps have come and different kinds of softwares have come. So this is easy to understand today because people are using this thing all as if they're alive, okay, and they're alive in their own way because a certain amount of information has been calibrated in a certain way to do certain things and it's almost alive, I think. M most people have a better relationship with their WhatsApp with than with their family, okay? <laughs> yes, people are so engaged with it because it has a character of its own and it's even predicting what's the next word you will type. Which uh, your family cannot do, your friends cannot do probably <laughs> So, this is just like that. It has accumulated a certain amount of information. This vast life that's available, around it we formed a bubble. This is my bubble, that's your bubble. What is the content of the bubble? It's the same stuff. But what is the surface of the bubble? My surface is entirely different from yours. And it has its own characteristic, it has its own flavor, it has its own tendencies. So this is an unconscious software that every one of us is building with phenomenal amount of information that we are acquiring as we sit here. The five senses are gathering a phenomenal amount of… the amount of information that one gathers in twenty-four hours of time. If you spend a million years, you can't process it. That much information we are gathering. This is what traditionally we refer to as karma. It's all twisted out in America, I'm seeing the word karma. Everybody's calling themselves karma now. You know, people are named karma. I heard uh, some people were named karma. <laughs> so we will… suppose we see right now the… we don't know how the outside weather also is quite good, I think, in the evening. At least the air conditioning is good, everything is nice, uh, you're fine. Every, nobody's troubling you here, but you're sitting here miserably. Then we say, ayo, it says karma. What it means is, the word karma literally translates as action or doing. So we say, who you are right now is entirely your doing. The way you have structured yourself, knowingly or unknowingly, the kind of womb that you were born in is also an unconscious choice because you created a certain type of tendencies 
that's where you moved in search of that kind of tendencies. What… what facilitates that? So this software is building up all the time unconsciously. So only thing that I want to say now is, whatever you can do unconsciously, if you are willing, if you are willing, you can do the same thing consciously. If you can build so much software unconsciously, if you are willing, you can restructure that consciously. I can show you millions of people who restructure themselves in a matter of few weeks. I can show you few people where the very shape of their face will change in twenty-four hours' time simply because they start a certain process. Entirely, their whole personality is altered within a matter of one or two days of doing certain processes because distancing yourself from your genetic memory, there's an entire process. Most Indians have forgotten, otherwise it was there in every family. Whenever somebody dies or even when your parents are alive, there are processes how to distance yourself from your genetic memory. Because this is very important, if you want to be a, a unique fresh bubble of your own, then you must distance your from, yourself from genetic memory, otherwise you will see at eighteen you're a great rebel, you don't want to be like your parents and this and that. You see when you're forty-five, suddenly you start walking like your father, talking like your mother, stuff is happening to you, you don't know because don't underestimate these people <laughs> They won't give up so easily. Your grandfather may be dead and gone, but the guy wants to live through you. So the thing is to distance yourself from ge genetic memory so that you don't become a cyclical pattern of repetitiveness. You want to be a fresh life. That means you have to recalibrate your software consciously. Anything that you can do unconsciously, you can all do, also do consciously if the necessary striving is there. What does it take for people to have that level of striving? It depends how far they want to go. If you… if somebody comes and asks, if I want to know the entire… not the new physics, what has happened till now, if I want to know, how long does it take? If a fresh student comes and asks, is there a time you can say? No, you can say, okay, start on a science uh, undergrad, let's see. If he does undergrad and he thinks he's beginning to know everything, then you start telling him, this is not it, you got to do your masters. If he does that, you will say, then you have to do your PhD. After your PhD, you're declared that you don't know much <laughs> That's right, that's the path of wisdom in so, science. The most… the most basic thing that one can do, how long does it take means, the most fundamental thing is, first of all, to know that there is another dimension of faculty within us, that there's another way of perceiving things that there is something beyond, not as a belief, not as a conclusion, not as something that is said in some scripture or by some guru or some teacher or whatever, but by yourself to know beyond this body, beyond this mind, there is something within you. This experience, if this has to happen, I would say if you are willing to dedicate just thirty hours of absolutely focused time, if you give me, in thirty hours time, we can bring you to a place, we can give you a tool through which you know something beyond your physicality. What that thing is, you don't have to jump into a conclusion, but something you beyond your physical nature will become alive within you and you know there is something beyond physical nature. If that is enough inspiration for you to continue your pursuit, then how long it will take the entire pursuit? You cannot say each individual is his own. So, what would it be like if you could get beyond the physical trappings? You know, we started a school a few years ago and this eight-year-old boy, I just walked into the school, this eight-year-old boy comes and asks, Sadhguru, is life real or is it a dream? I look at him, <laughs> this is an eight-year-old, you have to come with the truth, you know. I said, life is a dream, but dream is true. Go Sadhguru, you are always like this only. <laughs> But that's a fact. Life is a dream. The way it's happening within you right now, it's a dream. But the dream is true in your experience. But this dream, you can make it whichever way you want, whichever way you want. And we can make this into a fantastic dream for ourselves and for everybody on this planet. 
Science and technology has done wonderful things for us to enhance our dreams. But I want the scientists to meditate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.